Well, thank you all for coming to this event on a Friday morning. Uh, let me start off by, uh, first of all, uh, welcoming Christine Lagarde back to the Center for Global Development. Uh, I'm not going to introduce her uh, in any way, except the only thing I would like to say is that for those of us who are following what's happening in the world economy these days, uh, whether you look at uh, tensions amongst the major economies on trade, or you look at the emerging markets, uh, or you look at uh, uh, the challenges that continue to face low-income countries. And if you haven't read it, uh, I encourage you to read this morning's article in the FT on this, which Gillian uh, Tett wrote. We really uh, ought to be uh, very happy that uh, uh, Christine is at the IMF, at the helm of the IMF, at a time when the world needs a strong IMF. And uh, also that she has now made clear that she is going to be here for the next uh, three years until the end uh, of this term. And of course, as you know, that unlike other institutions, there are no term limits. <laughs> Sometimes that's a good thing. <laughs> So, uh, we're going to have Christy Nagad uh, introduce, uh, say a few words at the beginning. Then we're going to have a panel uh, discussion on what I think is really a, a very important issue that is important not only for Senegal, which is uh, in a way the, the focus of, of the conversation today, but if you had a chance to look through uh, the book, and if you haven't, I encourage you to look through the the excerpt outside, what you will see is that many of the issues that are covered in that book are relevant for many countries, not only in Africa, but many parts of the world. And, and I think we'll have a fascinating uh, discussion of that with the uh, different perspectives that our panelists will bring, but I'll introduce them uh, when I uh, get to that. So without further uh, do what I would like to do now is ask uh, Christine Lagarde to to share her thoughts with us. Thank you, Masood. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Masood. And uh, let me tell you that it's it's a real pleasure and privilege to come back to the uh, uh, the CGD and uh, and to see the the loyalty and the. Uh, irrespective of the articles and how long a term should or should not be to see Nancy, to see you, and, uh, and to have the pleasure of, uh, of uh, all this audience, uh, which I don't have to warn about the emergency exit and the procedure in case, in case something happens. Uh, for those of you who attended the sovereign debt uh, conference that we had yesterday, because we were still a bit uncertain as to exactly how and where this uh, Florence hurricane would hit, we started the conference with a terrible somber announcement about exits and emergencies and uh, how much water you can carry and all of that. So <laughs> happy that this is um, a safe um, environment and thoughts are going to the uh, North Carolinas and others who are taking the, uh, the hit from yet another natural disaster. Repetition of those. Anyway, this is not the topic of the day. So thank you very much for having me. And uh, I think that, C I, I wondered why it wouldn't be launched at the IMF, but I think CGD is a much better venue actually, and very appropriate to discuss this new book, which is released today called Race to the Next Income Frontier. And I'm deliberately not mentioning the, 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 the second part of the title because I think that it's a very generic uh, set of lessons uh, that are being uh, described in this book, which clearly focuses a little bit more on Senegal for obvious reasons. And I will uh, touch on the authors later on uh, in my uh, remarks. So why is it such a good and appropriate venue? It is because CGD is not just a think tank, as some people wrongly think. Uh, it's also an institution that is focused on finding the practical solutions to the most pressing issues that are facing the developing countries. And that's what the book does. Uh, it's a book that goes well beyond the, what, what should be done. It does touch on that, but it also says, how should it be done? And it goes into the practicalities and the details of, of how it can be done. 
So, as I said, Senegal is clearly a, a, a key part of the discussion, and it's a good example. Uh, the country of Senegal is a good example of a policy experiment with innovative learning. And Senegal has made considerable progress in building macroeconomic stability over the past few decades. Economic growth has been relatively robust, uh, at or above 6% in the last three years. But Senegal also faces major demographics challenges, just like many of its neighbors. So moving forward, given the demographics of Senegal and its current um, evolution and, and likely to be for a uh, you know, few years, if not decades, uh, Senegal has to actually produce growth in the range of 7 to 8 percent in order to provide jobs to the young population that is coming uh, to the market. And that is so because 45 percent of Senegalese are under the age of 14 today. Now fortunately, Senegal authorities are well aware of that situation and they have produced uh, what is called Le Plan Senegal Emergent, which aims to make Senegal an upper middle income emerging market economy by 30, sorry, by 2035. And the plan calls for a radical break with the past to broaden, accelerate and deepen reforms. These reforms will provide opportunities for small and medium enterprises to flourish and improve the climate for foreign investment. The goal is to build first class business investment environment make energy available at fair prices for companies and households, improve governance, and facilitate the diversification of exports. Those are the four key goals that are identified. But those of you who are in policy makings or have been will say, okay, great. How often has the word emergence? Convenient because you say the same thing in French and English, actually, emergence. How often has it been used by consultants around the world to sell their product to a developing country? Probably many times. So that in and of itself, if it wasn't for the clear four objectives that are identified and the way in which it has been consulted about, that wouldn't be so impressive and so singular. But because it deals with the what to do, this plan actually and the book in that it describes it, deals with the how to do it. And the task is not easy, but Senegal and other low-income countries have an advantage. They can learn from the successes of other countries that have been here before. Which countries? Cap Vert, Cabo Verde, Mauritius, Seychelles, smaller countries, granted, and islands as well but they have found themselves in exactly the same position as the position Senegal is in at the moment. And this is where I've said really nice things about CGD, so I have to say a few nice things about the IMF too. <laughs> and that's where the IMF comes in. Because I believe that the IMF with its 189 member countries is uniquely suited to be a hub for best practices and knowledge sharing between the nations. Quick, Francis, we are strongly focusing on better sharing of best practices, better leveraging of the knowledge of the institutions, and clearly the current technological breakthrough that we are experimenting, sometimes to our perils, are also providing massive opportunities in order to leverage the database, the information, the best practices, the article force, the technical assistance reports that we have in order to facilitate the sharing of information between countries. So this book is a fitting example of how knowledge can turn into action. It brings together different perspectives and offers invaluable lessons on how best to navigate the reform process. And in fact, we're already seeing some of the dividends. Let me touch on that very quickly. The drafting of this book, which in and of itself is an interesting process, has enabled not just the three co-editors co-authors, I would say, uh, but it has enabled the policymakers to identify 11 critical reforms in areas ranging from good governance to social protection. The government of Senegal recently established a monitoring committee with representatives from the key ministries involved in implementing the measures identified by the book. 
And I hope that during the discussion, Daouda Sembene, uh, whom I will introduce with all his attributes and titles in a second, at least as far as the IMF is concerned, will provide an update on the status of these reforms. Incidentally, Senegal is one of the 11 nations that are partnering uh, together with uh, G20 countries and the private sector as well under the G20 Compact with Africa in order to promote private investment as a way of better integrating their economies with the global economy. And this is just the beginning of what can get done. Recently, the IMF and the Senegalese Ministry of Finance organized a hackathon. Yeah, you know, that's true. We also do that. And we did that in Dakar to find ways to improve the government's tax collection system. And we had more than 100 young entrepreneurs, young, uh, in the main they were young, there were some white hair as well, but not that many. But we had lots of young entrepreneurs who came to share their ideas and make sure that they had a role in writing the next chapter of their country's development. The objectives are clear and a good agenda of policy reforms has been put together through the Plan Sénégal Emergent. But as we know, the road ahead will require continued effort, efforts to improve policies and to adapt to new challenges. And that is true all the time, even at times when there are elections coming up. Let me mention a couple of these challenges. First, despite the recent high growth performance, public debt has continued to grow. And this implies that looking ahead, the authorities will have to find a way to mobilize more domestic revenue in order to preserve their debt sustainability, while at the same time continuing to sustain a high growth performance. This is a difficult dilemma, but one that with policy resilience and determination can actually be addressed. And DRM, uh, domestic revenue mobilization, is one channel to actually address that issue. The ability to resist sometimes the unscrupulous offers made by lenders is also uh, an avenue. Second example of a challenge, the recent discovery of significant oil and gas deposits is of course extremely positive and everybody is, is in awe with these findings. But the challenge there would be to preserve good governance and fiscal transparency in the management of these oil and gas revenues for the benefit of the people. And here also, we will be very happy to share best practices with Senegal and with whoever finds itself in that lucky position to suddenly have oil and gas reserves in order to avoid the sometimes unscrupulous terms and conditions that we see abounding in previous relationships between some of the majors, for instance, and a particular country. So this book will help with these challenges. It is not only a call to action, it is a roadmap to reform. Ben Franklin once said, either write something worth reading about or do something worth writing about. Well, I think the authors have here done both. They have written a book worth reading and they have done it in a way that begins the hard work to make a real difference in people's lives for years to come. So what I would like to do at this point is recognize the three um, co-authors of the book uh, and they are all IMF colleagues. They are all staff members or former staff member. The two current staff members, I'll start with them, are um, our IMF Mission Chief for Senegal, Ali Mansour, our um, Salifu Isufu, the former desk economist for Senegal. He's former desk economist, but he's not former staff. And now, last but not least, former staff member, so he's a member of the family, uh, Daouda Sembene, who happens to be currently the IMF Executive Director, sitting on the board and representing Senegal. So to the three of you, really congratulations for this, this masterpiece work. So let me just say to conclude that I really welcome your uh, sense of practicalities and how to, in addition to what to. It's not just about prescriptions. It's also about how to go about developing and implementing them. And it's, it's a great contribution to 
the road ahead, which I wish will be good for Senegal and for many other countries in the same position. Thank you so much. Okay, so can I encourage now our panelists to come to the, to the front and we will get started. Dada is sitting here, Vijay over there. And Jude, so and I want to make sure that we have enough time because I see many people sitting in the audience who have a lot of expertise and experience working in the region. So it's important that we give enough time for you to participate in this uh, conversation. So we'll just start off with like a quick round of, uh, of questions that I want to pose to our panelists and then I'd really like to get uh, uh, your engagement in it. Uh, but before I do that, uh, Dada was already introduced by the uh, managing director. Let me also say that uh, to his right uh, is uh, Vij Ramachandran. Uh, Vij is, uh, of course, senior fellow here, colleague at uh, CGD, has worked uh, on a number of issues now around uh, the prospects for manufacturing, industrialization uh, in Africa and elsewhere. And I think we'll come back to that set of issues. Uh, and then Judah Moore, sitting to the right, uh, uh, is a visiting fellow at uh, CGD. And has experience in terms of uh, addressing many of the constraints that African uh, countries, particularly lower income African countries face in his previous role as Minister of Public Works uh, in Liberia, where he had a challenging uh, agenda for, for four years in trying to square the circle between the sort of enormous needs for infrastructure on the one hand and the very little financial and uh, an institutional uh, capacity to deliver on that. And then he uh, would have some interesting points to share. So maybe I'll start with uh, uh, you then uh, first, uh, Davda, which is we, the managing director rightly said that this is not just a book about sort of what needs to be done, but, but how to do it. And I want to go one step further and sort of ask you to think a little bit and share with us a little bit a sense of the political economy around these reforms. Because if you read the book, uh, you'll see that you, know, you wouldn't disagree with most of what needs to be done. Uh, you have some good tips on, on how to go about it. But yet we know that it's been difficult to actually do some of these things. Some reforms are easier to implement, others are not. So any thoughts on the sort of how you manage the political economy of implementing these reforms? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Masood. Uh, let me start actually by thanking CGD for hosting this event. I think we are very much grateful about uh, that. I also want to recognize before responding to your questions, the fact that uh, we are not only three authors for this book. Actually, there are 24 authors in, of this book. We are the three co-editors, me, Ali, and uh, Salifu. But we were actually lucky to have 21 more uh, authors who devoted their time to preparing this book. And those authors included my former colleague from the Ministry of Finance, um, many of them, but also actually members of uh, the academia in Senegal, the private sectors, but also uh, the central banks. And we were also fortunate to have worked with IMF staff and World Bank staff, uh, who were also uh, authors of this book. And finally, at the end, not uh, uh, the least, uh, is the fact that also we were lucky to have peers from countries like Mauritius, uh, Seychelles, and Morocco, who also contributed and also work among the books. So basically, that's a wide range of authors. So that being said, I think just to respond to your question, what we have, uh, uh, me and all the authors have uh, noticed, was the fact that actually, you know, why reforms are not being uh, conducted in Senegal and all the low-income countries that are in comparable situations, from a political economy perspective actually was related to uh, many uh, factors. First of all, I think there is wide uh, uh, evidence that um, uh, the lack of uh, consensus among various interest groups actually may um, stall reforms. That's something that we notice. The fact also that actually some of those officials that are in charge of uh, conducting those reforms may not have enough incentive to conduct those reforms 
for many reasons also was also one of the factors that are constraining reform. And so, of course, uh, you know, that is very prevalent in countries where there is uh, patronage and uh, clientelist uh, practices. And the, also the fact that there are some interest groups that might lose from uh, the reform being uh, implemented also was also a hindering factor for reform. So we started, we started from there and during the reform, uh, the, the book drive that we organized back in uh, 2016, uh, we brainstormed about it and I think actually there was a consensus that the best way to go about those issues and address those political economy impediment to reform was first of all, of course, to build consensus over reform. You know, in the societies, actually, uh, uh, various stakeholders may recognize the fact that they, the status quo doesn't help the society uh, as a whole, but they may not actually have the, 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 the same view about how to go about it. And now, how to build that consensus, I think, is the first part uh, to make sure that we something get done. Another uh, way to actually uh, you know, um, conduct reform is also to make sure that those officials that are in charge of implementing it actually do have the uh, incentive for doing so. And how do you do so? I think there are many ways to do it. Um, uh, I'm going to give you the example of Senegal, for instance. I think one of the issues that uh, we uh, noticed, or the authors also, were the fact that we have various agencies in charge of public uh, investment uh, management. Uh, there are those agencies that are in charge of planning, those that are in charge of budgeting, and those that are in charge of uh, mobilizing financing. And the problem was that, I guess, if you have that sort of um, uh, structure, you have potential uh, coordination issues that may actually impede good uh, in public investment management. So the, the solution that authors actually thought would be actually the best way to go about it was to, of course, uh, in, in improve coordination among those agencies. If you do so, you actually reduce potential uh, for um, rent capture um, mm -hmm. because you have to be sort of um, uh, uh, truthful that in the uh, administration there are those issues. And another problem also that we also try to address in the book was the fact that I guess uh, Senegal has always recognized the need to make sure that uh, its wage bill, um, uh, uh, the remuneration policy is actually uh, uh, reward um, good performance, and, but they have not been able to do so. And what was the reason? The reason being that you have actually all of those interest groups that are actually doomed to, uh, to, to lose if you are actually right. to implement that, uh, uh, that uh, reform, uh, including unions, of course, and uh, you have those expectations that, uh, uh, you know, no matter what we do, we have, we can actually pretend to, we can claim those um, uh, overtime, uh, for instance. And the issue now was actually how you can make sure that all of those interests group actually recognize the need to move forward and find some, some consensus to move forward. And m maybe one final issue that I certainly have to talk about, and it is extremely prevalent in Senegal, is, you know, the rent capture is not only in the administration. It is most prevalently also in the private sector. In Senegal, the industry is dominated by, uh, by the agribusiness industry, uh, and where there are... <coughs> Uh, a few uh, sectors where, uh, you know, including, uh, of course, vegetable oil, including uh, in um, sugar industry, but also uh, flour industry, where, you know, the industries are either uh, uh, enjoying a monopoly or a monopsony, and they have actually the potential to capture the rent. And they are not always very keen in letting actually any reform to move forward if those reform would actually reduce their uh, Share Market of the pie. Power, yeah. yeah. So I think actually the, what the authors have been thinking about is if you are trying to, if you are successful in building those um, uh, coalition that could include those interest groups representing those industry, maybe you could actually increase incentive for them to participate in the reform and let the reform process actually go on. Otherwise, I guess so long as they are not uh, for those reform because they don't to lose from those reform, they are actually going to use every pressure point they have, or every mean they have to, to, to block those reform. Yeah. And one, one last issue, of course, before uh, stopping, is the fact that, I guess, uh, you know, you build coalition um, uh, to, 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 to push for reform, and the best way to do so is to learn from the successful experience of other countries who have done it. And we learn from Mauritius, we learn from Seychelles, and of course, uh, Morocco. Thank, thank you very much, Dad. And, and I'm going to maybe ask uh, Tudor next, because in a way, you know, some of these issues that uh, Dado is raising probably are also very much present in, in in your case when you were looking at it in Liberia, maybe from a starting point that was less advantage, you know. Uh, so maybe it'd be good to get 
your sense on the whether the points that Dauda has raised resonate with your case? Were there additional issues that, that you felt you had to overcome in dealing with the agenda for reform? Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Neal. It's good to be here. <clears throat> um, one of the things I really liked about the book was taking into account the politics of the country and not just the economics. A lot of times we get these reform uh, papers and, and recommendations that essentially occur as if the country exists in a vacuum. So this is OK. Um, so building coalitions, they, the important thing also I think as, a, as an American political scientist, uh, Harold Laswell, who says that politics is about who gets what, when, and how. <laughs> and reforms always create winners and losers. Some of the losers are very powerful, and they can use their power in the economy to be able to thwart the reforms. So the, the book addresses coalition building among um, some of the rentiers and, and in the private sector. But an important thing to also take into account is because the industrial policy, because this is what this is, requires FDI, then we need stability, predictability, and certainty, an amount of certainty to hedge against political risk. And I'm saying this because if the um, industrial plan is tied around the legacy of a political figure, then his um, the, the, the success of that depends on the fortunes of that political figure or his party. So if there's an election and a new government comes to power, every new president, from the day he enters office, or she enters office, I should say that because my boss was a female, <laughs> she's thinking about her second term. And to run in a second term means I need some legacy achievements that I can run on. And so most times, it's, it's, oh, even if the economics are sound, the, the political dynamics mean that I must find something that I can attach myself to to be able to run on. So in the formation of an industrial plan, buying elite consensus, not only in the commercial and economic side of the country, but on the political side, getting the opposition party involved in the formation, then it becomes a national plan. And it's not a plan that is attached to any one person because that could be the undoing of the plan going forward. First, the second thing is amazing plan Wonderful execution, wonderful people doing it. Um, we're going to run into the issue of uh, infrastructure. Because when the plan, when the plan is done, uh, even if, and the book captures this, ideally, what we would do, we would form the entire economy. But because we can't, then we use maybe special economic zones. Because in these special economic zones, as the book outlines, we can be able to achieve the, the reforms that we want. However, even from the economic zone, to the port, there's a road. Recently in Nigeria, um, about 30,000, 31,000 tons of cocoa was stuck on a two mile road leading to the port in Abaya. So the country had done everything. Yields had gone up, private sector had gotten involved with the cocoa value chain, but the two miles leading to the port captured everything and in there, everything died. So. How are we going to finance this infrastructure is interesting because uh, Madame Lagarde talked about the debt question. Most of the countries in that region have some sort of IMF program. I, in my last role, argued with the IMF all the time about it <laughs> and argued with my colleagues at the Ministry of Finance about remaining within the IMF program. And so how do we finance the infrastructure that's going to be able to do that? So Madame Lagarde also talked about resistance to unscrupulous offers from lenders. Fair enough. But that resistance occurs within a framework where there are very little options available to countries in our position. So one of the things that we have to take into account, and I hope that maybe the book, the authors of the book, will provide guidance on how we do that. How can we maintain a balanced debt portfolio while at the same time financing the um, infrastructure spine that allows an industrial plan like the one here to be successful. So Judy and I have an ongoing conversation, <laughs> and I'm hoping we'll be able to turn this into a panel soon, about this tension that 
exists now in so many low income and particularly African countries where on the one hand, you know, from a macro perspective, risk management perspective, they're all bumping up close to levels of debt that look increasingly uh, difficult to, to manage. And there's a lot of media these days. It's hard to open a newspaper any day without having the story of sort of, you know, the Djibouti port and, and, and what's happened in Sri Lanka uh, out there. But at the same time, you have this compelling need to invest in getting the infrastructure that is actually going to deliver the growth and the human development, uh, both health and education, that is going to enable the skill set and, and healthy people to be able to make use of that and contribute to that. So how we balance that, I think, is a very difficult question on which there are different perspectives. Uh, and we have quite active discussions on this in the center, which I'm hoping we'll be able to share more broadly. I'll come to uh, Vich. So which maybe from a point of view of looking at it a little bit from the outside. So this is conversation about the plan and, you know, there's a plan emergent, but there's also, you know, at the same time when technology emergent, which is, which is changing the way in which we think about the dynamics of industrialization. So what, what are your thoughts on this? Thank you, Masood. I think, uh, you know, not to pile on too much, but I think the, the thing I worry about the most is that there are sort of tens of millions of people entering the workforce across sub-Saharan Africa in the next few decades. And the question is sort of how to absorb, you know, large numbers of, uh, of people who are entering the workforce and looking for jobs. Um, I think in that context, you know, the question of sort of how competitive are these countries and in what range of products are they competitive becomes a very important question. Um, you know, some of the data we've been looking at are around labor costs and understanding, you know, what labor costs are like relative to the GDP of these countries. Um, and one of the findings we have is that, you know, they, they are quite high for where many of these countries are. And that's sort of a worrying finding. But at the same time, we're also seeing some countries that are able to attract manufacturing. And I think the most visible is Ethiopia, but also other countries, uh, Senegal included, have had some success in particular types of industries. So I think the question then becomes sort of, you know, what can we do from a policy perspective to make sure the skills are appropriate to attract these industries where, where labor costs are competitive. Um, I think the other issue, you know, with Senegal and with much of sub-Saharan Africa is this question of this very large informal sector. And you have a very nice chapter in, in the book on that. And, and I see Nancy Benjamin is here, who, uh, who, who co-authored it. So I want to uh, give her a shout out. Um, that's another, I think, really interesting question in terms of policy. You know, how do we encourage um, productivity to increase in the informal sector? What are some of the, the things we can do? How do we even recognize who is operating in the informal sector? In that regard, you know, attempts to register firms and register individuals is, is very useful. Uh, but I think there are some things we can do, even though you know, some of the overall data um, look like costs are, are high. I think there are some, some places for intervention. No. Yeah. Good. There, I know many people in this room have views on this, so I'd like to go quickly to them uh, rather than pursue this conversation further. So if you would like to indicate, if you would like to speak, there's somebody with a microphone around. All right, so I've got a gentleman in the front row and two in the back. So should we start here and then? Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Paolo von Schirach, president of the Global Policy Institute. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting and stimulating event. Uh, I'm touching on your point, uh, madam, when, which I really think is critical. And having had you know, my share of experience in sub-Saharan Africa, I fully agree with you. There is a real disconnect between needs and skills. And I haven't really seen anything that is really, uh, how can I say, approaching a constructive and productive development uh, that would say, okay, this is what we're going to do to raise skills. This is our education plan. Maybe there is a future because of technology, online education, things. The internet is fine, broadband in, finally in Africa. It wasn't there 10 years ago, now it is. So maybe there's, there are new frontiers. But perhaps you can elaborate a little bit. You mentioned Ethiopia, a country I know quite well. But because of extreme poverty, it is that they can have ex rather low labor cost. South Africa, you know, it's absolutely, mar you know, they place themselves out, out of the global market. And we could go on and on country by country. So if you could elaborate on that and, and how that 
can support the objective of this uh, study because I'm sure that Senegal, a country that I don't know, you know directly firsthand, I know the region, uh, will need to address this if you want to give jobs right. to all these young people who are entering the labor force. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's take a couple more questions and then we will uh, come back to the panelists. The gentleman over there. Thank you. My name is Tom Van Boven. I'm working with FB2020 at the United Nations Foundation and wanted to touch on what you presented about the workforce that is coming, tens of millions of people coming in. At the same time, you're working towards an infrastructure to accommodate this. And I'm assuming uh, from what I've read that you're calculating in that this population will grow and that you will have to build on an infrastructure that is way bigger than what is currently needed. At the same time also, there is an incredible challenge to invest in contraceptives and family planning to re reduce the population explosion that is going on currently. And uh, so I was wondering up to what level is it uh, possible to influence the Ministry of Finance to spend more towards this health sector and to reduce this explosion that is happening and basically build towards a future where that is calculated in because that ex expenditures that are currently so difficult to get towards have an incredible influence on the demographic dividend on, in the long term. So I wanted to hear more about that. Thank, Thank you. you. And then there's a lady in the back there that I'll come to. Good morning, everyone. My name is Oluwato, and I'm studying at the George Washington University. My question is particularly to Mr. Moore because he did speak about infrastructure in Africa and how to mobilize funding. And you know, every time we talk about infrastructure in, in Africa and as well, you know, debt building in Africa, most of the challenges around people, there's a lot of focus on getting dollar denominated debt, you know, which is essentially a mismatch to the income of most of this country. So the question essentially, what is being done to one, build capi local capital markets in Africa? You know, because again, that's another avenue to mobilize um, domestic funding to address this infrastructure mm -hmm. need, as well as pension reforms, you know, in all of these African countries, both from, from, our, from our sector and informal sector. And then there is one more, and then we'll come back for one round of comments. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Brendan Horton. I was very interested to, to listen to this. I have a, um, I have, I've had the chance, actually, to have worked on Senegal from 1973 to 75, teaching economics and actually doing the first study on industrial competitiveness for the World Bank. So um, I have one question. Uh, what's different now? than then, because it sounds awfully familiar. Um, I listened to stories about sugar and mimeron and flour, um, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, more, I've also worked on Morocco, uh, a historical perspective of 50 years. So I have, in that context, really three questions that are pertinent for Senegal. How is the, is there still an exchange rate problem? Okay, that's absolutely critical. Secondly, I agree fully that the question of wage setting in the public and in the private and public sector is crucial. The differentials are enormous, and in that connection, one shouldn't forget that wages in public enterprises can be even higher than in the government itself. And lastly, which is more related, is, is the, are the, how do the solutions being proposed here really differ from a kind of traditional IMF approach that the only thing that matters is fiscal balance? Okay. So, Brendan, so you've got like a, a variety of sweeping statements about the world in that question as well, which I will leave on the side for the moment. But maybe not a bad place from which to start, you know, down the side. So I guess the question really is, you know, this is not the first attempt to try and build a plan, not the first attempt to try and address these yeah. issues. It's, what, what are the things that may give one more hope that this time around, mm. these issues will get addressed and that you're doing the kinds of things? You talked a bit about that in yeah. terms of the yeah. building consensus, etc. But is there anything more that you, that you want to say on that? And, and then the other issue, which I think it would also be uh, worth coming back to a little bit, is... Perhaps, maybe I'll come to you, Judo, this is, to what extent have, has there been a good conversation between whether it's the infrastructure ministry or the health ministry and 
the people who focus on the needs in that sector and the finance ministry, how can you actually have a conversation that helps you to balance these different uh, perspectives? And then there was a capital markets issue. Can we build domestic capital markets as a way of, of uh, addressing some of these financing needs? Yeah. And then there's uh, the question around the skill set that, that you first raised. So yeah. let me start with you and then go to the others. Well, thank you, Masood. Uh, let me start actually with uh, where um, uh, Brandon finished. Uh, uh, what's different in the approach that we are using compared to the traditional IMF approach? First of all, I think actually what I have to say, and I think Madame Lagarde touched upon on it in her opening remark, is the fact that I think in this book we are focusing more on how to rather than what. What we have actually realized in Senegal is if you know it is about actually making plans, development plans, and we have been always successful in doing that. If it is about actually sort of making strategies about actually you know how to get uh, um, uh, you know about where we want to go, we have been always doing that. But we have never been focusing on how to do it. And that's, that's a fundamental difference that actually uh, uh, we are trying to address here in this book. We try to look at actually how uh, some countries actually have succeeded in doing that. Of course, we recognize that actually whatever uh, recipe that they have used to succeed, we may have to sort of, of course, tailor it to our specific country situation. But I think the fact that we are using those um, successful experiences to see how we can move forward, I think this is already something that is actually going in the right direction. The second issue I wanted to say is, compared to the traditional uh, approach of the IMF, we put the focus here more on economic, or political economy issues, how to address those issues. Because of the traditional economies or the, the mainstream economies that we are all, do not necessarily actually place too much emphasis on the uh, political economy. I think we tend to think that actually, you know, when uh, we let the uh, market plays, uh, you know, uh, everything goes in the right direction. But the reality is actually you have to account for actually those possible special interest groups that are actually very powerful enough to get things stall if you want to go in the right direction. So that's where we are trying to put the focus there, and that's the, all the book is about. So let me give you one example. We have actually some of our authors, um, Patrick is there, for instance. They actually had this very nice piece about how Senegal can boost revenues. Uh, by broadening uh, the tax base, for instance. But the problem is, if you want to broaden the tax base, what do you have? You have the informal sector to broaden your tax base. The problem is, those in, uh, in the informal sector, you have very powerful traders uh, that actually are unionized and that can actually make your, 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 your reform uh, fail. So how do you address those issues? At the end of the day, you have to recognize that whatever um, solution that you might have to find, has to be, of course, in line with preserving the interests of those who are actually gaining from the status quo. And then, of course, you have to find uh, the we solution yeah, that how it also can benefit others. So I think that's extremely important. One issue that also I wanted to touch upon is um, you know, about the exchange rate problem. I don't think actually Senegal or countries in the YMO have more of an exchange rate problem than a structural issue, reform issue. The problem that many of those countries are facing is more of a problem of competitiveness, how they can make their economy more competitive so that they can grow. The issue is uh, that requires more structural reform to be implemented. It's less, in their cases, an, case, uh, an issue about the exchange rate. It's more about what type of uh, structural reform needs to be actually conducted to improve competitiveness and attract um, uh, investors, especially from, uh, from, uh, from uh, foreign countries. And I think that's where also you see the focus that is put more and more in Senegal and elsewhere on how to improve the business environment. And I think that's the, the, the way to go. Um, uh, maybe finally, I guess uh, one thing that we think actually is also important if you want to get things done, and I think that's the focus of the paper also, is you may need to identify some reform champions. Uh, not only from the administration, but also from the private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, what we did actually after this book, and uh, I think uh, that was very critical in uh, securing some of the progress that we have had uh, since uh, this book was uh, uh, made, is uh, the first stage was to come here in Washington. Uh, we were a delegation of 10 people from, uh, from Senegal, including Mr. Aliou Fay, who is there, uh, coming here just from Senegal and who arrived yesterday just to attend this uh, meeting and representing the finance ministry. What we did was we discussed about actually the reform um, process that um, could be helpful. And we, were, we asked each of the authors to identify one particular reform that could help um, uh, secure the type of objective that we were looking for. And that's how we came up with those 11 reforms. Now, when we get, got back to uh, Dakar, uh, 
we had a meeting between the authors, all of the Senegalese authors, with the prime minister and many line uh, and sectoral ministers. And we present to them those 11 reforms. And uh, we told them how we thought actually could the, you know, those reforms could be implemented. And after that meeting, there was clear instruction that were given by the prime minister and the minister of finance that we had an inter-ministerial committee that I was chairing at the time when, before I left uh, the Ministry of Finance to come to the IMF, that was trying to see how we can actually get things done. And those, those, those are the type of reform champion that we're talking about that can help move identify, the forward, move the agenda yeah. forward. So that's Great. important. Thank you very much, Salda. Mitch, any? So on the, on the skilling thing, uh, I think it, it's a difficult question. I mean, there's no question that investments in sort of basic education is the, probably the most important thing, you know, improving primary, secondary um, education and, and the outcomes uh, from those investments, I think is probably the most important thing. But it's also the case that firms invest a lot in training workers. And I think in that context, this question of automation has, is very important because yeah. what's happening to these supply chains? So you mentioned <laughs> agro-processing, which is important um, in Senegal and a number of other countries. The supply chains are changing fundamentally. Right? There's some parts of it that aren't changing at all. There's other parts of it that's becoming fully automated. And so that's a displacement issue that we have to think about. And then there's sort of a, a third um, set of issues around the blurring between manufacturing and services. So tasks that were previously in a, in a manufacturing <coughs> supply chain done manually are now being, um, you know, you, you have to code, a, uh, uh, you have to write a program to have a computer do the task rather than uh, doing it yourself. So I think this sort of changing nature of the supply chain, we need to understand a lot better um, in the context of this whole sort of overall conversation on automation. And if we can sort of get a better handle on how these supply chains are changing and what parts of it, um, you know, are shifting uh, to sort of more service type uh, jobs, then the investments that firms make, we'll have a sort of a better understanding of what the kinds of investments are um, that need to be made in terms of upskilling workers to be able to cope with this, you know, this changing nature of the of the supply chain. I think there, from a policy question, you know, what is the best way governments can help with this? Clearly, their own investments in training have not been successful by and large, really, sort of anywhere in the world, not just um, in in Africa. So the question is then, you know, how can we best sort of aid? businesses in doing this kind of upskilling? You know, is it credits? Is it some sorts of subsidies? Is it tax policy? I mean, I think that's the set of questions we're all sort of trying to struggle with in the context of this wave of automation that we're all kind of so worried about. Thank you, Rich. So I think um, up to this point, for a while, if a country, especially a developing African country, had said anything about industrial policy, you got run out of town. And so that the IMF is actually promoting this book that is basically about uh, Senegal's industrial policy. That's a good start, right? That's something that's different. <laughs> and uh, industrial policy, yes, is market-based. Yes, it's, um, it's private sector-led. But essentially, as one of my colleagues told me, is it, it, the industrial policy is a coordination mechanism between the different government agencies. So it comes back to the question that he asked about the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Health, in terms of how we're going to be able to deliver on this. But what's different now also, I think, is the impossible future that Africa stares at, right? The Population Reference Bureau released a report recently that uh, 26 countries are set to see their populations double. Most of them are in Africa. Niger is set to see its population triple. Now, those numbers are frightening if we aren't creating the jobs to be able to absorb them. But the second thing also is like, so I was Minister of Public Works in Liberia, and uh, Monrovia was essentially built for about 350,000 to 400,000 people. And now, out of the 4.2 million people, about a third of that lives in and around Monrovia. The infrastructure is overwhelmed by the numbers. That is what we're set to see repeated across the continent. So if we can create the jobs to be able to absorb these numbers, and we can create the infrastructure to be able to ac accommodate these numbers, then I know every time you, you look at the newspaper, it, it shows uh, uh, migration to Europe as the big thing. But most of the migration occurs within the continent. It's Africans moving from one African country to the other. And so uh, the largest growth aspect is supposed to happen in Nigeria, where we're supposed to see the population of Nigeria grow up to 411 million. <laughs> Just thinking about that, and most of that growth is supposed to happen in the north and the northeast of Nigeria, where we currently have most of the problems. So African countries 
The success of Plan Emotion Senegal is an excellent example for the countries, especially around it, to be able to copy what are the things that we can learn if it works here in the case of Senegal that we can be able to apply to, um, uh, to, apply to uh, the other countries. And I know it's become my thing now, but it's almost impossible to have a conversation about industrial policy in any country, whether it's Senegal or other countries in the region, without talking about, I mean, we've danced around it, but we haven't talked about the influence and role of China. I mean, is I, I can't imagine what country in the region now is crafting this industrial policy that doesn't actually take into account engagement with China. China now owns close to 20% of our debt. Um, uh, all of the debt of uh, low and middle income countries around $6.9 trillion, and China owns 21% of that. It is such a massive player. But China has also been exporting um, its uh, um, uh, overcapacity, right? Whether it's in manufacturing and everything it produces. So for countries that are set to st establish special economic zones, China is going to be a big player. So for the, the authors of the book going forward, one of the things I would like to see is guidance for us, the countries that have to deal with. Um, because most times when we come into the room to negotiate, what is, it doesn't even, it's not just China. Whoever it is that we're negotiating with, the leverage is so different in terms of what we're bringing, what they're bringing, and the power asymmetry is so stark. So the African Development Bank has the African Legal Support Facility. I used it once in my negotiation for private sector on the bridge. But having something that advises us, that guides us in terms of, so we're creating uh, industrial policy that's supposed to address these problems that are highlighted. But how do we come into this room, especially from the disparity between the actors we're negotiating with and our position? I, I think this is an excellent start. Again, I have to commend the IMF that the IMF is actually promoting industrial policy for an African country. We, we should be excited today, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I think we may discover, Judith, that <laughs> industrial policy is like prose. You know, we have been speaking it for a long time that, without realizing see, that. Exactly. That we were, you know. uh, so I think I have uh, uh, Nancy next. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much. What a great conversation uh, you have all contributed to. I had two questions for Mr. Somben. Um, one is on this issue of the uh, um, unreasonable debt accumulation. And the question is, do you feel that you have enough access to resources from the major public institutions, the multilateral banks and the IMF? <clears throat> is that an issue in itself? If there were more resources, you wouldn't face the same stresses, say, between, well, that we've discussed. This is related also to what um, Giudi said. The second question has to do with what's different, including on the industrial policy side. And I was thinking, as you were talking about the East Asian miracle uh, in the 60s and 70s, the, the tigers, the Koreans, and so on. And one of the things that they had was some sort of, uh, you know, get-togethers between government officials and, the, and private sector firms as a group. And I think you referred a little bit to that idea for Senegal. And maybe you could just, I didn't catch it fully. You did so in the context of rent capture and mm. that this approach might prevent capturing of rents by, I guess, specific. So could you say a little bit more about it? Are you talking about getting together all the firms in a particular industry or getting together different industrial groups or what? With the government. Uh, then I have Ali Mansour, who's of course one of our co-editors of this book. No, she's... Um, I'm just going to make some comments which you may want to react to rather than asking some questions. I'm going to start by saying that um, change can only come from people in the country who want to make change. The role of outsiders is just to strengthen their hand in the internal discussion. But with that in mind, first, China clearly is key. And I just throw some thought. Um, we have the BRI, which is a lot of money without a framework. Mm -hmm. And we have the compact with Africa which is a framework with no money. Mm. 
Now, in an ideal world, <laughs> in an ideal world, these would be brought together. But in a non-ideal world, that integration actually needs to be done by the countries. Yes, so I, I leave that as one thought in terms of going forward. Mm. And clearly, the international institutions can help to do that. But again, it has to be people in the country who want to do it, and we support them, not us telling them, you need to do this because it's a good idea. Mm. The second thing is that, um, as you correctly said, this is we've been talking in pros all the time. All countries, or virtually all, except, except maybe Hong Kong, <laughs> do industrial policy, but it's, it's uh, not a question of whether you do it, it's a question of what you do. And the big lesson is most of these efforts have failed. The ones which have succeeded are the ones which have focused on integrating the local economy to global value chains through exports. So th the key question is how do you get that going? Mm. And again, one needs to think how BRI and CWA can help that process happen. In this context, the big elephant in the room, it's not maybe it's a visible elephant because Dauda <laughs> referred to it as well as the other panelists. The real big problem is the problem of rent seeking and patronage. This is what's holding things back. And each country needs to solve this in their own way. But there's a political deal which is needed on this. Uh, in most cases, the, re the rent seeking patronage lobby is so strong and has proved so strong over the last 40 years that global reform of rolling back these rents doesn't happen. Mm. So one needs to think, and again, the, has to be done by the people in the country. They need to think, looking at what others have done, how they solve it. Many countries have done it by taking enclave solutions. Bangladesh does no better in doing business than Africa. However, they developed a textile co uh, industry with Korea because they decided that you can have a lot of rent seeking elsewhere, but in this sector we won't. Hmm. In the same way, even in Europe, um, some of the Eastern European countries still have poor overall governance, but they have integrated into the European automotive sector because in that sector, we agree that we are going to let that one be open and transparent and not subject to rent seeking. So I think unless we have an honest conversation at the level of each country, um, what to do about the rent seeking, and Daoud, I think, referred to it, that is really the big challenge. And that's where I think our role is to help people in the country think about what is their solution to that problem. Thank you very much, Daoud. John Hicklin up there. Um, thank you. I was going to ask, um, in the context of formulating a reform program that might work, what are the pros and cons, uh, from your perspective, in Senegal of having constraints from regional arrangements for regulatory reform, industrial policy, comparative advantage, rather than being on your own, or more on your own in Liberia, Mauritius, and so on? What, what are the perspectives that that brings to how much choice uh, you can take? Okay. Anybody else? Alan in the back there, then a gentleman back here, and then we'll come okay. back. Okay, Th thank you. Alan Gelb, Center of Global Development. Thanks for a wonderful uh, presentation and discussion. I have a question about the borrowing. We always go back to borrowing infrastructure. We look back to the accumulation of debt, and we look forward to the accumulation of more debt. And always, the borrowing is linked with infrastructure, right? But if you look back at Senegal and at Senegal's borrowing, how strong is that relationship? Could, are, are you happy that when Senegal has borrowed, as many countries have borrowed, that it actually has been used uh, you know, productively, <coughs> effectively, efficiently to create infrastructure which is actually operating effectively? Thanks. Thank you, Alan. And then this gentleman back there. Uh, Tetsuo IC. Uh, I was... Uh, very struck by your, your uh, assertion that BI does not have a framework. And, and I seek <laughs> your comments, reaction to that. Do you agree with that? Is that because uh, BI indeed doesn't have a framework? Because President Xi has articulated many, many times. You go to their website, they have five guiding principles. They have articulated very, very well. Or is it that, you know, for the Western perspective, we're not just get used to it. 
and, and, and don't consider all those articulations <laughs> as a framework. Uh, following this infrastructure uh, uh, question, you look at BRI's current troubles, right? So whether it's in Pakistan or in uh, Sri Lanka, uh, what, what lays out is that the government, the local government just doesn't have the credibility. And the private sector needs to invest in private sector, uh, it needs to invest in infrastructure. However, once bitten, it's always shy. So how, how do we overcome that? Okay, I think I have one more question here and one in the front, and then we'll bring it to close, yeah. And then, all right, so we've got three. And yeah. yeah. Hello, um, I'm actually from Pakistan, and I was um, thinking in terms of China also from the start of the presentation and BRI. Um, I think some uh, two people have touched here on the some of the issues that are developing on the in towards from BRI, but I'm taking into account some of the external perspectives. So if you're thinking of borrowing from the IMF or from another Western country, what are the conflicts that can arise through taking help through BRI? And because they are trying to contain through foreign efforts in whatever way from diplomacy actions or from economic um, SAPs, what are the issues that you're seeing that if China is investing um, in Africa, what are some of their terms that they can put through that are going to contain those efforts? Okay, thank you. And then there was a late frontier, yeah. He, he has a microphone. Yeah. Oh, you've already got the mic, so why don't yeah. we do that? Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, I'm Sailesh Prasad. I represent e Export Import Bank of India. I have a little different question. In fact, uh, we are also partner to your growth. Uh, in fact, uh, you have borrowed a lot of for the infrastructure. And uh, the actual infrastructure development during the course of development, in fact, happened across the countries through you know uh, PPP model. Uh, so how are you graduating from this you know, typical borrowing structure to PPP model? I mean, what are the policy prescriptive and what is your you know, thinking process on that? Okay. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for this great discussion. I'm Alka Bhatnagar. I've just uh, retired from the State Department as a Foreign Service Officer and my last posting was in Sub-Sahara. So I was fortunate to be working with a lot of youth. Now this youth was very well educated, skilled and motivated to do something about their own countries at the grassroots level. The biggest barrier that they saw in the business development was corruption. So could you please address that? How did you contain or how can you contain corruption in those countries? Okay, thank you very much. So I think maybe now I'd like to just come back. I guess in a way that was an interesting question that's come up from different angles. We were mm -hmm. just spending a couple of minutes on perhaps is this whole issue of how you get around the issues of corruption, governance, patronage, to actually move forward with the agenda in different ways. And, and you know, Ali had, a, had one set of examples of how countries have managed to perhaps isolate and, and contain that. So that's kind of one set of issue. And then a second, which I think it'd be good to get reactions from everyone also uh, on, is this set of questions around Financing. So, so I'm kind of thinking we're actually setting up another panel here, which is about <laughs> you know African countries' choices and options on financing today, uh, and to have that conversation in depth. But any quick thoughts on is there enough financing from official sources, and if not, you know, are there actually trade-offs uh, in borrowing uh, from both that we need to take into account? So that'd be another set of questions, and and any other last thoughts that you have before we close. So maybe this time I'll start with uh, Judy and work my way back. Sure, uh, thank you, Masood, again. Uh, thanks for... Uh, on the question of, of... I just wanted to address the question of uh, uh, graduation. Uh, the um, colleague, the fellow from the Exim Bank in, uh, in India talks about graduating from the normal borrowing that we see to PPP. I'll give the example of Zambia. After Zambia graduated from HIPIC, by 2011, the total debt was, was what, five loans equal to around $500 million. Between 2011-2015, Zambia did 30 loans, um, around $3.5 billion. 
most of those were because Zambia was now had access to international markets and there were Eurobond issues. So I think there are African countries that are going away from you know, borrowing. The problem that happened with Zambia then was that 60 percent, before 2011, 60 percent of Zambia's debt was to multilaterals and were concessional. Yeah. By 2015, it was down to 20 percent and 50 percent of Zambia's debt was to private uh, uh, holders. And currently what's happening in Zambia is that the international markets, international financial sector does not have confidence that Zambia is going to be able to pay the debt when it comes due in early 20, uh, 2022 and 2024. That's the problem that Zambia is having currently. So I think like uh, uh, Ghana has done it, Mozambique has done it. There are a, a number of African countries that have accessed the international financial markets to be able to. But I think the fundamentals of the economy, though, aren't strong enough to be able to support that. Zambia has 90% of, of what Zambia exports is copper to, to China. And once there was a, a weakness in the market, everything crumbled. On the, and so a lot of African countries continue to find themselves in that situation more and more. And, but Zambia, unfortunately, has graduated from HIPIC. So Zambia doesn't have access to concessional financing anymore. Right? So the African countries for whom going outside the normal route of borrowing they're not at the point yet where they can be able to do that and they will continue to come back to, to this. On the question of corruption, I think it's something I w that's worth addressing. Again, I said one of the good things about this book, and this is a really good thing about this book, is that the book tackles the political economy. It's not simply about the economics, it's also about the players. And rent seeking is a big part, and that is the corruption. However, I have a different view on corruption. Um, in Liberia, we, they, they, when we were negotiating our compact with MCC, MCC pays for a, uh, an economic diagnostic of the economy to answer the question, what is the binding constraint to economic growth in the country? And this diagnosis came out, it's called constraints analysis. And the constraints analysis, two things, were the binding constraints to economic growth in Liberia. Weak infrastructure, really. It was roads and power. Now, it didn't, say, it didn't mean that corruption wasn't an issue. It didn't mean that um, bureaucratic red tape wasn't an issue, but the binding constraint to economic growth were those two issues. So I think corruption is a very, very important thing. And USAID, the US government, the Europeans have spent a lot of money on, um, what is it, uh, uh, reforms of the, the public sector. And, 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 you know, decades later, millions of dollars spent later, that's really, we, we really do not have convincing evidence that has actually made a difference in the lives of the people. So <clears throat> I am of the view, and, and I, I'll have to close with the, the, the gentleman from, from, who spoke about BRI, who has a completely different view from Ali's in terms of BRI having a, having a so currently, and, and this has come more and more, and it's been in, in the stuff I've written recently, it's more and more come out of um, American policymakers about the role of what is BRI lending, or maybe it's through FOCAC, of Chinese lending, and this come of this debt trap diplomacy. And, and the, the evidence that's been used over and over is what's happened in Sri Lanka with, the, with unable to service the debt and, uh, seven, for 99 years, uh, China basically taking over the port. My take on that is over the last 15 years, between 2000 and 2015, there have been 84 instances when China restructured, waived, rescheduled debt with countries without taking assets. We're not going to take one instance and make that yeah. the signature issue in terms of defining the relationship with China. I, as an African, as an African from a region that's faced issues, when Tanzania and Zambia first approached the, the, the West about building the Zara, they were told it's uneconomical and it's unnecessary. 1967, it was China that came, spent $400 million into these dollars, that's $3 billion to build that. So for a, for a continent that has increasingly faced this in terms of when we approach and say this is infrastructure we need, we've been told it doesn't make sense, it's not something that you should do. I, I'm not prepared to concede the space that Chinese lending or BRI lending is without direction or that is meant to intentionally ensnare its partners into debt so that China can be able to extract um, unfair concessions from them. What I believe that 
what I believe is this, that this relationship hasn't been perfect, but on balance, it's been a net positive for a lot of African countries. We still have to address the issues that Ali raised. Most of the issues that are holding African countries back are in internal. It is about strong and powerful interest groups within the country that stifle any reform that will actually transform our economies. But beyond that, right next to that, is the absence of infrastructure. On every section of infrastructure, Africa lacks the rest of the world. And with our population growing, as I said it is, at some point, something's got to give. Before we get to that point, I believe BRI offers us an excellent opportunity if we can marry it to the compact with Africa. I believe that's an up that those are two trends that will actually be able to deliver for us. And to be able to get there, we can use something like they've written, like an industrial policy for each of the countries. So thank you, Judith. Thank you. There we go. So just, just briefly, I'll, I'll pile on to that a bit. I mean, the, the, data, the data seem to suggest, you know, overwhelmingly that also for, the, for businesses, infrastructure, or uh, notably the reliable supply of electricity is the biggest constraint. And that's just such a key part of being able to, you know, to grow and be competitive and so on, that it is really great that after decades of saying this, we now have a set of players that are willing to take these risks and make these investments in infrastructure. You know, I've been arguing for a long time that we need to re take another look at Inga, you know, which has the potential to supply so much power uh, in the region, but you know, the traditional players have always sort of shied away. So I think I'm with you on that. There, I think we need to look at the optimistic side of this. There's definitely going to be some messes, mm -hmm. but I think finally we're seeing some big investments in infrastructure, and that's, I think, a very critical part of this whole sort of process of looking at, at the constraints to growth. So. Well, thank you, Basu. Um, let me, before actually talking about the um, question about corruption, address uh, the issue that uh, Nancy raised about the accumulation and whether concessional resources actually were adequate. I'm going to wear my uh, uh, hat as executive directors of the IMF <laughs> <laughs> right now. What we, what we keep saying, um, and actually what we keep hearing from our authorities, is the fact that I guess uh, the recent trend of uh, declining ODA in the past uh, few years is not necessarily actually helping in um, um, uh, at supporting their sort of development endeavors in their uh, um, uh, in infrastructure project and so on. So basically, I think there is a ample scope for multilateral uh, de development uh, institution uh, like the World Bank and others to sort of um, uh, replenish their concessional resources with a view to helping those countries actually achieve their development objective. But that's not enough. I think actually on top of those uh, concessional resources, there are many low-income countries, particularly those that are function market uh, economies, that actually can uh, have access to non-concessional resources and that have an adequate uh, capacity to repay. And I think actually one concern that uh, some of those authorities have been also actually exp um, expressing is the fact that uh, those non-concessional windows are not necessarily always actually accessible, not only in terms of um, uh, level, but also in terms of timeliness in many ways. I think there is a reason why many African countries go to China, because I guess, you know, uh, maybe it's for them it's uh, much faster than uh, what traditional uh, uh, multilateral creditors are actually giving them. And the other issue I think that um, I wanted to quickly clarify uh, responding to your second question is the fact that, you know, in this book, we, the authors actually propose two types of solutions. When you're facing rent-seeking behavior, you either sidestep them by creating those economic spaces where with their own governance and institutional framework and even their own tax regimes. Of course, that means that you don't address the rent-seeking uh, um, uh, uh, behavior that are actually outside the economic zones. Uh, and then you just set up those special economic zones where you, know, you scratch everything and you start from zero. That's one way to do it. But another way to do it also is, I guess, to try to if you're not actually establishing those special economic zones, is to address the problem to its roots uh, by uh, trying to limit. You won't be able to, re to eliminate all rent-seeking uh, behavior, certainly, but you can try to limit those um, opportunities for rent capture. And how you do it, the first way, of course, is to strengthen your governance framework. 
and your institutions. Because I think there is ample evidence in the literature that those countries with strong institutions are able to face better rent capture um, um, by uh, uh, renters anyway. So I think that's one way to, to go about it. That's also, we look at both, um, uh, both options. So now on the corruption issues that um, some of um, the um, uh, audience have been talking about, I think, you know, there is uh, in one uh, chapter in the book, and I wrote that chapter, which is about the uh, link between governance, institutions, and emergence. Uh, when we do it, what we have seen, we have been trying to compare not only Senegal, but low-income countries in general, what, how they fare in terms of aspect, various aspects of governance, how they fare compared to other countries around the world. First of all, we noticed that, I guess, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in general tend to fare or to lag behind all the region when it comes to various aspects of governance, whether it is in terms of uh, regulatory capacity, in terms of governance effectiveness, whether it is in terms of control of corruption, or whether it is in terms of, I guess, um, uh, uh, voice and accountability. Senegal, in some ways, actually uh, fare much better than many low-income countries on average. But actually, what we have seen, based on the data that the World Bank has compiled as part of its worldwide governance indicators, what we have seen is, although Senegal Senegal actually fare better than those countries, they have not been able to sustain such improvement in uh, various aspects of governance for the past 10 years. And I think that's a scope for um, uh, the authorities to reflect further about how they, uh, they can address that. And they are trying to do it. Now the question is, whenever you want to uh, control the corruption or those rent-seeking opportunities that we talked about, you need, of course, to have a more effective government. And how do you do so? You have to make sure that uh, you can have predictable policies, you can have transparent policy making, you can have, I guess, uh, strong institutions that actually are built up and most importantly you also needs to institute the rule of law uh, in many countries of course you have the in jury the jury uh, institution for the rule of law but in, in practice uh, you know the the elite is able to get things done the way they want so I think actually those are ways also to make sure that you can address uh, the, uh, the, the the corruption so maybe one final um, uh, question that I also wanted to address has to do with the question that Alan talked about whether borrowing in Senegal is done in an effective manner in an efficient manner or productive manner there I, I think I uh, have to actually refer to one of the uh, um, chapter in the book that was written by a university professor who happened to be my former professor, professor, um, <laughs> professor Bunanya. And I think his analysis is to say that, well, there is scope for making borrowing uh, uh, more effective and efficient in Senegal. And how to do so, he advocated for the use of fiscal rules. Uh, I think the, for them, if Senegal was to able to set some clear fiscal rules to, that would, they would abo uh, obey, I'm talking about the government officials, he thought that maybe that would be a good way to have more effectiveness in, uh, and efficiency in the way actually borrowing in conducted. And certainly, I guess, um, uh, Gude and Vijay have uh, responded to all the questions. Yeah. So, thank you. Well, th thank you very much. Maybe just as we close, I, I want to perhaps make uh, three, three points that I took away from this conversation. And one of them really relates to uh, this conversation around debt financing in the broad. And, and I think people have raised a number of questions uh, which it would be worth trying to bring together in terms of the choices and options for low-income country financing. I'm a bit worried, for example, when I hear conversations around debt as being linked only to to infrastructure, because you can make a very strong case that you know the, you should borrow as much for social sectors as you borrow for uh, infrastructure. The question is how much you borrow, on what terms, and whether or not at a country level you can manage these uh, liabilities. So I think there's a set of issues around that and around the choices countries have in terms of China. And we've, yeah. we've sort of been framing it a bit, China and, and uh, the traditional lenders, but let's not forget that actually a big increase in the debt in African countries that today find themselves at risk of debt distress has been market borrowing from banks. And mm -hmm. bank lending, and if you look at the repayment numbers coming out for the next three, four years for a number of these countries, mm -hmm. it's the bank lending which is actually going mm -hmm. to be uh, an issue. So, so we do need to take, I think, a little bit more of a holistic approach to, to this set of trade-offs. The second thing I want to say is that I really think that this, this focus on political economy in this book is something we should uh, 
think about how to apply more broadly because there are many, many reports and books that come out on what needs to be done. And they're sort of variants of, of each other in some ways, but there are far fewer efforts to try and analyze the political economy constraints in, in a more systematic way. And I appreciate that these constraints perhaps vary even more across countries and the what needs to be done but it is worth trying to have a look at it. And the final thing I wanted to say is kind of interesting that I, one of the colleagues here raised the issue of demographics and the pressure of demographics. And, and I think uh, you mentioned also some of these numbers. And I, I feel that the combination of demographics and migration in terms of pressures is something that, that we tend to underestimate in, in looking at both current and future. And I have a friend, uh, Jean-Michel Severino, the, in, in France, and he was giving me a, a, a number which stuck in my head uh, because he used it in, in a meeting. And, and it was to say that if you looked at the last 60 years and, and compared Ivory Coast and France, six, last 60 years, if France had, in terms of demographics and migration, evolved in the way Ivory Coast had, it would have a population today of 300 million people with 140 million migrants. Mm. And so his question was, are we anticipating or thinking through the pressures that that would pose? So it's easy, it's a little bit easier to sort of point to the governance failure, the institutional failures, the, the lack of uh, service delivery. But if one had to face that magnitude of demographic and, and migratory uh, pressures in, in any country, you can imagine the consequences in terms of how hard it would be to manage them. So I think that, that in a way, one of the aspects of looking at the political economy is also how we manage the political economy that comes from dealing with these forces going forward. So I wanted to kind of share that, but also take this opportunity to ask you all to join me in thanking our panelists for what has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay tuned.